So here we are again, Rob Napolitano and Bob Repass, two big guys in non-performing loan business. Actually, one big guy. It's just Bob here. I'm just, I'm just a, <laughs> I'm just a student trying to learn as much as I can from the much experienced, uh, um, well experienced man in the business. Well, thank you uh, for that uh, brilliant introduction. And you know, Rob, you're just a sponge, man. You just soak it all in, and you know, you, you learn everything you can. So, uh, well, we try to make money from it too. I mean, we try best we can, I guess, right? Um, so today, that is the goal. That is the goal. That's, that's, it's always the goal, right? Exactly. Um, that's that. That's the race that we're all in. You know, it's funny that you say that. That we're talking about that because I think we wanted to talk a little bit about financial literacy today. But ultimately, we could talk about this all day long. But in the end, the common denominator of no matter how literate or illiterate people are, the common denominator is we're all just trying to advance ourselves in life financially. Um, hopefully in other parts of our lives as well. But the common thread and the common theme for everybody is to advance ourselves economically, financially, and, uh, you know, in lifestyle. Um, yeah, I, I agree. You know, it's funny. We were talking before we jumped on the air here about, you know, the hockey playoffs and, and so forth. And, and that mentality is always survive in advance. But when you get to the financial literacy part, you got to forget the survive part. Right. You want to get past that and you want to be advancing on a, on a regular basis, you know, whether it's month to month, a year to year, you know, a three year plan to a five year plan, whatever it happens to be. You want to advance. you got to get off the surviving advance train as far as the uh, financial you know, planning piece of it. So I think we can talk about this in future episodes. There's so much to cover for financial literacy, um, you know, just you know, whether we're talking about, you know, kids and, and teenagers and college students all the way through generational wealth and, and how to plan for a future. So we can't cover it all today, Rob, but we can start wherever you want and we can just kind of share thoughts with each other. Yeah, I, I'm not, you know, as you say that, you know, let's just kind of couch this and give some 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 perspective here to this conversation of financial literacy. And as you said, it's just you know, we try to advance ourselves and we're sometimes taught just to survive in advance. But um, getting out of that survival mode, um, to me, means getting out of the job, right? It's when you have a job and your only stream of income is trading hours for dollars. Uh, that's when you're in survive and try to advance mode in order to get out of the survive part of that you got to look beyond your job you got to be you know making your money go to work and having different uh, or or additional streams of income while your job can be one of them and for some people it should be one of them and the primary source of income um, but it for everybody it shouldn't be the only source of income if you want to get out of that survival mode people need to know how to put their money to work. Um, and maybe the first thing to do is to tighten up the belt a little bit and rein in the expenses a little bit and, and spending and, and, and the expenditure side. Um, I don't know. I mean, just some random thoughts that went through my head as we're talking about this. I mean, being literal, literate in finance is not easy. It's not taught this stuff in school anymore. And people have different sources of teaching sources of learning and different belief systems really of what yeah. I think you're you know, right. There's a lot of folks out there that's got that nine to five mentality that they just got a corporate job or the, you know, they're a W2 employee and that's their only source of income and they're just working the grind day in and day out. And uh, they are surviving and advancing, you know, or trying their best to anyway and finding those additional revenue streams you know, whether it's, you know, investing in notes like we do or, or whether it's investing in real estate in general, um, you know, or whether they go off and do some other entrepreneurial adventure, you know, trying to find other ways to, you know, to maximize their ability to, you know, make a dollar. And, um, you know, you had made a comment there, you know, well, they don't teach financial literacy in school anymore. I'm not really sure when they ever did on a, on a full time basis, but. Um, I think as we talk, 
um, last time, you know, my kids are a little bit older than yours, but, um, you know, I was, I've seen people that, you know, they went to school with as they progressed and, uh, there's people graduating from high school and even college that they don't have a clue, you know, I mean, to really, especially ones maybe from high school that aren't planning on going to college. Here's the, here's what I see as a dilemma, right? You've got people that come out of high school and they don't go to college. So they don't know anything about balancing a checkbook, savings and so forth. And then you have people that do go to college who don't have a clue and they come out of college with tens, if not hundreds of thousand dollars worth of debt that they're never going to get rid of unless, you know, they mat- they wave a magic wand in Washington and decide to forgive it, which we all know about, you know, in the business world and forgiving debt. We're not a huge fan of, of like just arbitrarily. Why are you doing that? Somebody lent the money. Somebody's expecting him to get it back. Um, but, you know, they're, they're just entering the world at 18, 19 years old, whether it's to college or not. And they have no foundation on what, what are they going to do? Even when they get their paycheck every Friday, what are they going to do? Right. So I had a conversation with someone earlier today. and It's interesting. We were talking about the different generations and, um, you know, the school that you and I come from, this, you know, I got mostly the school of hard knocks and, uh, and, 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 and the world that, that next generations come from with all the technology that they have uh, inter, interfacing with them and the information they get and how they get information. Um, it's just interesting to see how um, younger generations look at this stuff and how they build their belief systems and what money is, what investing is. And I, I, countless number of times, you know, I see younger people talking about how they've done very well for themselves in investing because they know how to push a button um, because everybody else is pushing a button on an app. And when you push this button, next thing I know, my account goes up. You know, we just went through a period of time with low interest rates where everybody was making money. Uh, 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 Corporate equities were up because of all of the stimulus debt that was being poured onto balance sheets, which increases, uh, I'm not gonna say value, it just increases the price without increasing any other value. But yet on an app and on a trading app, the number went up. And so if my number goes up, I must be making money. And that's how they form their belief systems is I put money in, the number went up, and so I must be good at it without understanding any of the underlying fundamentals as to how this works. And, you know, you and I are in the debt business and the stress debt business and, you know, people leveraging up. Not many people understand what that even means and even less amount of people understand the flip side of that, how to deleverage, which is part of the process that we're in. Right. And leveraging up and deleveraging and going through these cycles, um, they create a lot of false beliefs about what real value is. Um, and, well, and, and, and you know, over the last decade, plus or minus, they've made it easier for folks to, you know, invest in various things, right? And we've benefited from that, you know, raising capital and so forth. You know, it, it's gone from an accredited investors only type thing where you knew the person and, you know, you had to know them in some kind of a relationship in order to raise money to pretty much, you know, un, unaccredited investors that have a hundred dollar minimum that could join some crowdfunding platform and press go. And, and, you know, like you said, hope to see that raise, you know, or they could buy Bitcoin or, you know, or they could buy a fractional interest in a master piece of art somewhere. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can take $100, $500, $1,000 and some alternative investment. And you're right. They live on their phone anyway. So they're just pushing a button and saying, oh, I must do really good. You know, Van Gogh's treating me good today, Rob. You know, I, I really like that. Um and I think they, I, they don't I have that foundation. They don't have the whole concept of what drives things up and down. Agreed. And I think that if we did, here, if we watch this one. If we did an NFT of Van Gogh's ear, I think we'd do very well by trying to sell that. What did he just say? What? They what? would know what I just said, but we have no idea. What? <laughs> we could probably sell it. Wait, what ear? What? What? Okay, whatever. Um, but interesting, you know, you say that, the credit investors. Um, 
Think about this. While the accredited investor is clearly defined by the SEC and the thresholds, and I always found that interesting, accredited investor, see, they, they, they try to create this impression that being an accredited investor comes along and implies that there's some semblance of intelligence there. Um, but yet they don't measure it by intelligence or sophistication. They measure it by income level or net worth. Right. So now let's look at what inflation does. Inflation comes in, or let's even see what the pandemic does with a lot of these stymie checks, with a lot, and, 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 uh, artificially inflating um, the markets. Well, people's net worth went up. Does that necessarily mean that they became more sophisticated? Not necessarily, but yet they qualified as accredited investors all by fictitious value that was pumped into the marketplace. Yeah, um, and, so, and now 12 months later, they may be non-accredited investors. That's right. They lost some of that net worth. And, you know, I think that's a great point because, you know, when, when you're looking at accredited versus non-accredited, okay, it is clearly defined, whatever. But we look at it, especially when I'm raising capital, as sophisticated and unsophisticated. Right. Exactly. Because do you we are very particular on who we take money from. Right. Because if it's not a fit, it's not a fit. Life too short. I don't want to do business. No doubt. Absolutely. Whether, whether they're sophisticated and just a pain or they're unsophisticated and are going to have questions every day. You yeah. know, it's like you've got to find that right mix. So I, I like looking at it from a sophisticated and unsophisticated. There's a lot of accredited investors that they may have inherited their wealth. Uh, you know, they for some reason, they hit a home run on, on a certain deal and, and, you know, whatever. But they are not sophisticated and they are blowing through that that money faster than they know what to do with. Yeah. Um, and, and there's others that have worked their way up and built a great portfolio and a great net worth and they are sophisticated and they're very, you know, the other, the other description, Rob, that we talk about is passive versus active investors, mm -hmm. right? You know, in our business, if you're raising money for a fund, you want somebody who's ready to give you money and be passive in the background, not try to micromanage what you're doing in the fund. Absolutely. Whereas an active investor, if you want to buy assets, we'll sell you an asset. You can go yeah. actively manage it all you want. Yeah. So those are kind of the differences we look at, passive and active and sophisticated and unsophisticated. Right. Yeah. Um, and but we don't and any of these, we don't do any kind of, you know, financial literacy foundation quiz to see if they're financially astute or not. That's right. It's and it's and, and it's interesting because we do a questionnaire to and I, we did very similar to you where we will not only check their accreditation because we require to but we also check for um, expectations we also check for value systems we also check for um, if our interests are aligned as well in our missions. And, 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 and make sure we have an alignment of that as we go a little bit further, just like you do as well. You have to go a little bit further, not just the accreditation. That's the beginning. You want to make sure you have the right investors um, that are behind you and don't want to micromanage. Um, you know, I've done and I'm sure you have, too. I mean, you've been around long enough where you've gentrified your uh, cap table, gotten rid of investors that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. But. They're there and now things have changed and they probably are not your right fit client anymore. We need to move them off the cap table and put somebody else who's a better fit in there. Uh, and I think people should do that all the time, especially if they're sponsors, fund managers like we are and stuff. You know, always go through your your cap table with your investors and making sure that they're aligned with you and with, with values and, and, and they're not um, on top of, of doing too much. I just saw... Um, a video of Jack Ma, um, Alibaba. Yep. And uh, let me see if I can remember this real quick. It was a very quick little video, and he was talking to his audience. Said, "If you're between 20 and 30 years old, go and don't work for a great company. Go work for a great boss. 
and learn. Yeah. If, if you're between 30 and 40, you should start looking at what you're good at. If you're between 40 and 50, you should be doing what you're good at. If you're between 50 and 60, you should be seeing who you should be supporting in the younger generation, support the younger generation. And then if you're in 60 above, you should be spending time with your grandkids. And it was very interesting how he would, because look, there's your, this, this part of financial literacy, right? You should know what your values are, what your roles are, what your stage of life is, and how you should be looking at this stuff, right? How many, how many younger people do we know? We're like, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, start my first fund and I'm going to raise $250 million and I'm going to retire by the time I'm 40. It's not where you are. That's, that's not going to happen. It's right. rare that it does. Lucky if it does, but there are other circumstances. Know where you are, know what you should be doing, build a solid foundation, and always start within your means. And that all goes back to literacy, knowing who you are, where you are, and don't compare yourself to the next person and what they have and what they don't have. And know your strengths, know your weaknesses, know where you can provide value, and build relationships. It's all about relationships. Yeah, for sure. And, and leveraging those, right? Who you can learn from. Exactly. And, um, and then also, as you mature, like you said, you know, giving back, having relationships, you know, I always look at it the three tiers, right? You have relationships with people above you, you know, folks that have, you know, you can learn from people below you, you know, people that you can be a mentor to. And then yeah. peers like us, you know, people that are in the same business, kind of in the same, you know, life cycles, you know, as far as where we are in the business world together, that we can share ideas and learn from each other. Um, I mean, even though you're significantly younger than I am, uh, I, I still consider you a peer, but I'm glad to be your mentor, too. So, Well, I was just going to say, since you, since you went that way, I was going to say, although you're much nicer, I was going to say, you know, being that you're putting that scale there, I can't imagine at your age as many more people above you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were much kinder, but I couldn't resist anyway. I was just waiting no. for my opportunity to stick that in there. <laughs> The reason we do this is so I could tee it up for you on a regular basis. <laughs> so if if when we publish this, I'm sure we will, and people are listening, I will tell you how I do talk about you when you're not around. I tell people, you know, that I know Bob Repass, and um, you are someone that I hold very dear in the business because, as you remember, we may have spoken about this before, uh, so Bob is a guy that I met early on in my career as a fund manager in 2014 when I was a newbie in the fund, running a fund. But Bob always was very kind and took me under his arm and um, showed me a lot of things that he didn't have to. Um, but he always made it very clear that when we're competing for money and investors, we're definitely enemies. But when there's none of those people in the room, I can always consider him a friend. And not only did I respect that. But I always respected how you knew where to draw the line. And we always respected that line. Uh, and I always had a great amount of respect. For you. And that's one thing that you did teach me, though, right, it, is that we're not while we are competition, we you know, there's no better way to succeed than cooperating as well. And you can cooperate with competition as long as the ground rules are set and everybody yeah. knows where they stand and where the lanes are and how the lanes are divided. And everybody respects those lines and those lanes. Absolutely. And so that's that's one thing you taught me as well is it can work so long as there's clarity as to where the lines are drawn. And, um, well, Rob, it's, like, know, any other relate, it's like any other relationship. It's about communication, right? Communication and transparency. As long as we know where each other stands and what the lines are, you know, I, a lot of times, you know, I'll just answer the question when people say, are you guys competitors? I go, well, I look at it more as like counterparties. Like sometimes we do deals together. Sometimes we help each other and advise each other on deals. And sometimes we chase the same deals. You yeah. know, I mean, it, ju it just depends. But you're you're always going to run into a situation where either a deal's too big or a deal doesn't fit your quote unquote box that you can do with somebody else. Right. Absolutely. All the time. And and, and honestly, you know, that when when, when you exposed me to that and I learned that from you. I honestly use that as a uh, a barometer for some of the new relationships or new people that I run into, right? To see if they, going back to 
you know, creating relationships and doing business based on values. If people that I'm talking to, new people that I'm talking to can believe in that too and do a little give and take, you know, without an NDA in place, without holding stuff close to the chest. You know, are you someone that holds everything close to the chest because you think you've got the gold that nobody else has? Or are you open and honest about sharing what you have and where your weaknesses are and where your uh, uh, deficiencies are and looking for help to uh, cooperate with others, you know? So how people react to that, to me, is um, your qualifier for me and who's in in relationships that I want to get. And it served me well because most of the people that you meet are not like that. But then again, you don't want to be with most people. You just want to be with the right people. And those are few and far between. And that helps you to select the right people that you surround yourself with uh, and using that as a barometer to, you know, measure people and what they're about. Um, so when you're, um, when you've been in the business as long as I have, and, and you run into somebody who has the secret sauce and they're not going to share it with you, you're kind of wondering like, really, I've missed the secret sauce after all these years, you've got something that I, you know, not that granted, I can still probably learn from them, but I doubt it's a secret, you know? So well, I'm like, listen, let's, let's, you missed let's, the secret sauce because if you had the secret sauce, you still wouldn't be doing this business. Right. So you're still here. <laughs> Uh, I'm here to announce my retirement. Because <laughs> <laughs> you found the secret sauce. Yep. <laughs> only, only was it McDonald's or Burger King has a secret sauce? Who had the secret sauce? McDonald's? I think so, yeah. Every time you get a Big Mac. Yes, it was the Big Mac, right? <laughs> secret yep. sauce, lettuce, cheese. I remember those commercials. There, you go. there is no secret sauce. The secret sauce, here's the secret sauce, and you know this. It's Honestly, it's, it's, it's compassion and thinking with your heart and your head and not just your head. It's not all about making money. You make money with your head, but you actually get deals and accomplish things in life with your heart. That's a combination of the two. That's a secret sauce. It's finding the right balance between your, your head and your heart. Yep. That's all it is. Yep. Most people don't know that. And, and again, most people look at a doll. You know, even this, it, yeah, everything's about a spreadsheet in this business, right? Whether we're looking at tapes or whether we're doing models to figure out what, you know, modification kind of yield can turn like, you know, what are we, you know, how are we structuring a uh, 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 default calculation? What's the workouts going to be? You know, it's all numbers, numbers, numbers. In the end, it's all a judgment call, yeah. right? That's, yeah, your that's judgment call is your judgment call. I'm at a point right now where I've, I've just been – inundated with spreadsheets and models and all this. And I'm like, <clears throat> I'm losing my secret sauce, which is doing the deal and, you know, dealing with people and, you know, from the head and the heart. And I'm trying to build up my team to where I can rely on them to do all the number crunching. You know, I have to look at it and say, okay, here's where we're at. Here's where I think I can make a deal. But, you know, I, I've been, over the last nine to 12 months, just down in the weeds, just trying to figure out all this. And I'm like, you know, I, I only have so much bandwidth. I need some help on the number side. And I'd rather be on the phone, like you said, saying, OK, so here's where we're at. Here's where we, you know, and making a deal happen, relying on my team that the data I'm using to make that decision is right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally, totally get it. I, uh, I totally get it. But it doesn't surprise me as you say that you're inundated with all these models because you know you're such a handsome guy for so long and i love how you probably had all these models around you because you trick people thinking that you know making people think that you're from new york but that southern accent just throws people off and makes you very intriguing so the model surrounding you does not surprise me um well i was born in new jersey and i grew up with my grandparents on Long island so i was a yankee fan back in the day but I did move south when I was like 12. So, you know, I won't tell you exactly how long, but it's been at least almost 50 years. So, uh, so, uh, so we've been down here for about eight months now. July will be, uh, will be a year. And it didn't take more than, I don't want to say three months before my daughter started texting me, y'all. No. <laughs> the y'all started coming out. And so she started to adopt, you know, some of the, the, the southern <laughs> slang as well. Well, I thought, you know, maybe in the future episodes, you could have, you know, number one draft pick Bryce Young from the Carolina Panthers join us on our podcast because, oh, you know, see. It, you know that's, see. that's the talk of the town there now in Charlotte. I hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 
So financial literacy. So let's say, okay, so let's go this way. If you had, if you had, if you were teaching a class of millennials on financial literacy and you had 30 seconds left to speak, what would be the number one thing you would of advice that you would give um, millennials as a takeaway? What would you have them do or advice you'd give them? Probably learn the pros and cons of how to use debt. Okay, because, you know, in on some degree, debt's a bad word, right? You have Dave Ramsey, you have all these people out there, don't get in debt, don't do this, on the, which I totally get because people get way on the other end of the spectrum where they're so overloaded with debt, they can't dig themselves out of it. But as we know in our business, there are ways to maximize and leverage debt, like you kind of touched on briefly earlier. You know, so if you know the pros and cons, don't run up credit card debt, don't run up student loan debt. That doesn't mean never borrow money, never find a way to whether it's short term hard money lending, whether it's long term, whatever, whether it's buying distressed debt like we do. There are pros and cons. I mean, we could talk about, oh, budget your money, learn income expense, blah, blah, blah. But if you're going to grow in like we talked at the top advancing, if you're going to advance, you have to know the levers to pull on the debt card, mm-hmm. I, I think. And that's not a 30 second takeaway. That would be like come back tomorrow for class and we'll talk more about it. But right. that would be my my close. No, I get it. And, 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 and so to summarize what you said, I totally get it, is what you're saying is there's good debt and there's bad debt. And you need to know the difference between the two. Absolutely. Debt is not a one size fit all. It's not a good or a bad thing. It depends on how you're using it, what you're using it for. And there's good, bad, and there's bad debt. And they should know the difference or learn the difference between the two and when to use it. I think you summarized it great. I think that's key. I think if you know that, you can advance, right? You can get out of the nine to five, get a check every other Friday and that. And you can figure out a way to have that additional revenue stream or streams you know, whether you're going to buy a short term rental and, and have an Airbnb or whether you're you know, going to buy a performing note or a non performing note, or maybe you have one and you want to borrow against it in order to do another deal. There's all kinds of ways to do that. But if all you know is to swipe the credit card and just run up that debt, that is not the lever to pull. Ninety five percent of the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I was on a panel the other day, and uh, and I forget how it came up. But for once, a question was asked where I didn't have an answer for, and I what? deferred. Yeah, that's what I. So there, somebody, so somebody in the comments said, "What? Rob didn't have an answer." Is there like, a, you know, I mark this moment, stamp the time. Rob didn't have something to say. Video I could find so I can watch that. So uh, and it was I about. Did. And it was about ground. You know, it's, it's interesting because it was about ground up construction and the dangers in ground up construction. And that's right. So that's not my forte. So I'm just going to defer. And um, the other panelist that was on there gave a whole litany of, of, of risks inside that. And all I was there saying, yes, that's why. That's why. I'm glad I deferred. Everything that she said, my comment is everything she said is what I'm afraid of. That's why I don't do it. So go. I did come back and say something about it. But <laughs> I couldn't really articulate it until she said it. And I'm glad that I deferred. And so, um, but another thing came up where we're in such an upside down world. And I said, you know, experts only become experts because they happen to say something profound and so outlandish at a certain point in time. And then later on, it just happened to get come true. And they went back to that and say, hey, you know, I said that before, so I must be smart. And so I made my stance right there. And I said, the way the world is right now, especially in this country with real estate, don't be surprised if Section 8, the rules for Section 8 get expanded to short-term rentals where vacation vouchers are being given to people so that they can get Section 8 vacation vouchers to go on vacation to keep the short-term rental market going. Well, Watch that happen now. If if you would have said that on our last episode a couple of weeks ago, I would have said no way. But since then, 
Um, if you're telling me that the guy with really good credit is going to pay more, so somebody with not so great credit, yes, you saw that in the house. I'm like, anything is possible then, because if I have 800 credit and I'm going to pay more in my monthly mortgage payment, so somebody with 600 credit can buy a house, that is an upside down world. Yes, I made a comment on that the other day, actually about why that wouldn't pass, but I don't remember why I said that. I had a thought on that. Um, why? Oh, that's why I said it's not going to pass because I believe that ends up being a, um, a discriminatory issue, a reverse redlining. I said <laughs> some smart attorney is going to look at this and bring up a class action as reverse redlining targeting people based on financial status, which is exactly what the subprime, a lot of the subprime stuff was when they were targeting people with lesser financial status. Well, now you're just flipping it around and going after people more financial, and that's just reverse redlining. Yeah. And so it's a predatory practice, and somebody, I think, eventually will pick up on it. Other than it being rhetoric to create headlines, I don't know, and I don't believe that it's always going to go through, but you never know with this stuff. And if it does... There'll yeah. be a bunch of attorneys, I think, that'll have a feast day on this because the redlining and the predatory practice that it is. I agree. That's what I said about that. I know we're going to wrap up here in a minute. So you put me on the spot a minute ago, so I'm going to put you on one. Um, remind everybody how old um, your son and daughter are. Uh, my daughter is going to be uh, 13. She's going to start. She's going to be a teen in two weeks. And then uh, my little guy will be nine in July. All right, so you have 30 seconds to give them financial literacy advice, and we're going to pick up on it next time we chat. But just tease everybody and tell me, what's that advice you're going to give your uh, young children? At what part of their life? Today? Yep. So the advice that I give them is I, I already do this. I, 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 we put the practice in place that every dollar they receive, and they can recite this, um, 40% goes into savings. 40% goes into uh, spending, 20% goes to charity. And so if they um, happen to, and we do some volunteering stuff all the time as well. And if they volunteer their time, then right. they're allowed to take some of the money out of the uh, charity bucket and put it into their spending bucket. Um, oh, so that's a good core value there. And invest, uh, save, and then charity as well. The three buckets. Yeah. Well, very um, good. And they'll be able to recite that as well. Awesome. Well, they can always invest in the Rob and Bob podcast and, you know, use some of that to uh, sponsor us. So uh, we need, we need to get dumb money from somewhere. So we might as well start with that. <laughs> uh, so, all right. Uh, well, with that, we'll wind this one down and then we will see everybody on another episode. Thanks everybody for listening in. Thanks.